So in your final exam, on your final exam, um, 40 points are going to be given if you can tell the, or this is 40% of your exam, is telling the story of the God and the Machloket, Machloket in the early narratives of the Torah. And you'll recognize this chart because we've gone over it a few times in class. And you'll also be asked kind of these three questions about, um, uh, and you'll have 10 points for each of them. These questions should be really easy after if you're able to do the first part. So they're really actually very related. So um, the uh, in the next, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes or so, I'll be trying to kind of explain what we've discussed in class. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. So uh, here we go. Um, so if you remember, in our very beginning of our class, we heard the idea, we looked at this thing called the Mishnah. Mishnah comes later than the Torah, um, or it's part of the oral law, maybe that was whis whispered from God to Moses and then was kind of passed ear to ear down. And in there, we learned at the very beginning of our course that there is this thing called machaloket. There's this thing called dispute and uh, disagreement, but that they actually, there are two categories for that. And there's actually the possibility for there being a good dispute and a bad dispute. And the Mishnah really tells us, gives us the two sides of a continuum, right? It gives us two sides of a spectrum. They say something called a, something that is really good called a machloket l'shem shamayim, a, a dispute for the sake of heaven or an argument for the sake of heaven. And a machloket she'eno l'shem shamayim, a dispute that is not for the sake of heaven. By the way, interestingly enough, when they talk about the dispute that is not for the sake of heaven, they bring up something from the Torah itself. They're saying in the Torah, there's an example of a bad dispute. But when they come up with a, when they talk about a good dispute, a, a dispute, machlok at l'shem shemaim, they give as their paradigmatic, as their best example, an example of something that happens during rabbinic history, during by these two people, Hillel and Shammai, that are not in the in the Torah at all, not in the Bible at all, but are much later. So that's just kind of an interesting aside. So here we have these two ideas that there is such thing as a machaloket, and there is there is a, a, and there and it can be divided into the good 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 kind of disputes and bad kind of disputes. So the beginning of our course was really about asking about does God want the I does God want machloket to be? Does God want? And even from this point in the course, when you haven't even discussed what comes next and looked in specific courses, you can probably say, well, actually, because there are two kinds of machloka, one we're calling good and one we're calling bad, then yeah, actually, God probably would like there to be machloka. But there's always a danger that that good machloka can turn into a bad machloka. So a part of this course is kind of trying to understand, you know, where do the machlokets that we do see are they closer to the good stuff? Are they closer to the bad stuff? What makes something a bad thing? Um, and, and, and that's what we've been trying to discuss as well. So then we kind of go on in our course and we kind of start looking at the different stories of the Torah and we try to ask the question, are there hints within these stories that talk about, you know, God wanting there to be machaloket, that God actually encouraging and God hoping for Machaloket. And by the way, we saw yesterday the very, right, in the golden calf story, almost like almost God little hint to Moses saying, leave me alone. Basically saying, leave me alone so I can do what I need to do. But God kind of winking and being like, don't leave me alone. I want to hear you argue and make sure and, 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 and tell me not to tell me to kind of change my opinion in a way. So there's this like, uh, so, but that's that, that's later. We're talking about the beginning stories of the Torah because I want to know if at the very, very beginning, there's a sense of, is God the creator of Machloket? Does God like Machloket? Is God trying to kind of get rid of Machloket? And I think actually what we're going to see is that there's a lot of kind of this going on, that we're not quite sure what we know that actually God has created situations where machloket exists. We're not entirely sure if God is happy about that or is sad about that, but we do know that God reacts to it by going in a different, slightly different direction in the next story, or God is really happy about it and kind of goes ahead with that same direction. 
So, um, so I think we can say that we almost learn about God's reaction by what God does in the next story. That's why we're kind of trying to see this history of, and in a way I would be like, uh, I think probably an answer to this question is that, um, we're, we're, that, that God is trying to discover what it is that God wants. And these stories are helping God kind of understand, do I want there to be machloket at all? Do I not want there to be? Have I created it? Am I happy with what I've created? Am I not happy with what I've created? Right, so, um, okay. So here we go. So first we looked at the Garden of Eden story. And, um, and we asked the question, like, did, was God trying to create a world where machloket doesn't exist at all? And if so, what's your proof for that? And is God, if God attempts to create a machlok at this world, then how do humans respond to that society? And you could look at the Garden of Eden and say, actually, everything is there. There's no possible way for people to disagree at all. And yet God does create that one rule about don't eat from this tree, almost saying that that I'm not ha like I could have created the world where I'm doing everything. Why do I even need there to be a rule at all? So in a sense, God feels like it's really important to see if people follow or don't follow, see if people agree or disagree. And part of that, I mean, there's agreeing and disagreeing. I mean, you could have agreeing and disagreeing without arguing, but maybe the arguing piece comes up as a result of the disagreeing that maybe God is trying to create a possibility for the people to disagree because the opposite is agreeing and probably there's no argument when there's, when there's just agreeing. So how does the, um, like, 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 why would God even create that tree and create that rule of what, of, of what not to do? All right. So I think that's really what I would explore in, in, in that idea. Right. And I have a bunch of these questions to kind of, for you to think about. Um, and, um, and then we ask this question, right? This is a very destructure of how God created the world Did that actually create or exacerbate or like kind of elevate the idea of rebellion and disobedience in the world. And that's really where we looked at the two creation stories, right? We said that if we look at the first, if we look at the two first chapters of Reshit, the first two chapters of Genesis, we see in chapter one, we see God creating man, right? And Elohim created Adam in his image, in the image of Elohim, he created him, male and he created them. And this was that famous Rashi of like one being, one being, sorry, one being, that is split in the middle and there's equality there, right? So it's like one being split in the middle, right? One is not higher or, or one is not lower. However, in, in the second chapter of the Torah, we see this idea of creation story happening in a very different way that, that actually man, woman is created from man. So there's this kind of sense of hierarchy. Woman is created in order to fulfill a need of loneliness that man has. So like I'm created to fulfill the need of someone else. So I'm existing in this subservient, in this hierarchical relationship. And what we we saw in our class was, or we raised the possibility, is that if the world had stayed as kind of the equal, right, creation story number one, then there probably wouldn't have been reason for there to be any machloket or anything. But the very fact of hierarchy creates this machloket, which makes us ask the question, well, why is there the second story, right? Why doesn't the Torah just have story number one, people are equal? Why do we have story number two? And is it because actually God was said, God, it was, it's almost like there's a passage of time. First, we have a creation story and maybe God's like, oh, this, that's too boring. Like, I, don't, I, I can't have a world like that where everything, you know, is equal, where people get everything they need. I need there to be a little bit of friction. I need some excitement in my life. Almost like God kind of destroys that and actually says, okay, actually, this is the real creation story. And in that, I, I'm just suggesting that as an idea that, that in that creation, right, we, we actually didn't look at that idea of God actually, creation story number one is something God destroys, like a, almost like a flood story. And then we're starting again. We looked at it as kind of like different perspectives on the same story. So saying like, are people right, kind of having us ask the question, what are we in our society today? Are we this kind of society or this kind of society, right? So, but 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 it begs the question, why do we have that? And maybe it's saying that, that God is kind of bringing it in, saying like, I want this tension because I want this 
um, this fighting. I want this arguing that that kind of that hierarchy brings about. Right? And then we looked at kind of all the differences between the two. We looked at, uh, and here we have right differences again between those two stories. And we focused specifically on between creation story number one and number two about that hierarchy. And I asked these questions, right? Hierarchy equals superiority, hierarchy causes conflict. Does, is hierarchy a necessary part of the creation story? Does the man-woman hierarchy of creation story two come about by how man women are created alone? Or are there other factors that create this hierarchy? I mean, these are all good things to consider. Um, and then and then really it's this, it's it's Judy Klitzner who uh, who asked this question of like, is it because of the hierarchy that actually the snake knows that the snake actually has something to exploit? The snake knows that he, she's not going to, to Adam because he's at the top of that hierarchy. She's going to the person that needs something in a sense saying that, that, that disagreement comes about when you have a need for something that is not being fulfilled. And the snake knows to exploit that. So she, he goes, the Nachash goes immediately to Eve, to Chava, and says, hey, I can make you equal again. And that striving to be equal is kind of a, 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 a striving that we all have, and it brings about kind of our arguing and our disagreeing and stuff like that. And again, so if we step back and say, well, God created that, God created that whole system by creating this, this story number two, then maybe God is the creator of Machloka, okay? And God is 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 using the serpent to exploit that, but almost like the serpent's actually maybe not an enemy of God, but actually is helping God to help Eve realize, hey, I can help you get to a level of equality again. All right, all right. So um, so let's move on. Um, and right, so and this is her. This is kind of the line that she says here. Because of a woman's relationship inferiority, she, she seeks out something. She needs something else. She's not satisfied, and can therefore be tempted by the crafty snake. Right? Okay. Um, so, like we we ended we ended ended that story of the Garden Eden, kind of answering all of these questions that you might want to just kind of look at. Stop the video and kind of look at here. Right? Um, okay. So now we're up to the Cain and Abel story. And um, and I'm really going to um, going going to look at this, and, and we kind of try to ask the same questions of this story, um, and we see that Abel is born first, Cain is born second. So there's no uh, even though they're even though they're 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 so they're not twins, right? But they're born first and second, and we have this sense of what happens next in the story of like one uh, one of them bringing an offering to God, one of them bring, bring a, a, a better offering, one of them bring a lesser offering, um, and, and having different two different occupations and stuff like that, there's kind of this differential that's, that's created. And, um, and that differentiate kind of whatever those two those things do, they show that there is an inequality. And the great thing, and again, I, I really believe that Aaron was our, was, was our big... Um, well, well, and obviously that uh, that inequality kind of causes anger, and these are the three two midrashim that say basically they it causes them to argue with each other, with each other, and and we brought up these two midrash three midrashim to show that I, three different ideas of what they were arguing about, right? Because it says it says here, right? Cain said to his brother when they were in the field. Cain sat upon his brother, and they are asking the question, what did they actually fight about? And these midrash saying actually they fought about um, power, like land. They fought about um, they fought about uh, religion. They thought about they fought about sex. So it's kind of like everything in the world, right? Um, that you could possibly be fighting about. These guys were fighting about, and um, and basically because they're fighting about everything, it means really they're fighting about nothing right they're fighting they're they're fighting because they're angry and resentful at each other and just one thing that kind of aaron aaron has brought up which was really an an important one here is that we see here um uh abel being born first cain being i'm sorry sorry uh cain being born first abel being born second and so like there is that sense of hierarchy there and we see an attempt by favoring abel's um Abel's sacrifice 
that we are seeing a sense of like taking Abel and trying to kind of push Abel up a little bit. And again, what Aaron brilliantly said was maybe this is God reacting to the fail, the, how hierarchy caused problems in the Garden of Eden story. And God's saying, oh, because the second person didn't have what they needed, that's why there was fighting. So if I raise that second person to a level that's better, um, um, it will cause no fighting. So here we're seeing actually God is trying to eliminate Machloket, okay? and yet Cain is still really upset. You know, Cain is Cain is like, uh, no, I, 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 this makes me completely angry. I want to be, uh, you know, I want my position. I like my position, and I want to be able to offer something. Um, don't tell me that my brother is equal to me or better than me. Uh, and at, right, and by by raising Cain, uh, by raising Abel. Cain doesn't think they're equal. Cain actually thinks Cain is lower, right? So, um, so, so, so Cain fights. Cain fights back. By the way, let's also know that both here and in the story of the Garden of Eden, right? God asks Abraham, Adam, Ayeka, where are you? Of course, God knows exactly where Abraham, uh, Adam is. God wants to hear from 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 adam god wants to hear his voicing his either i'm sorry or um or i didn't do anything wrong i want i excuses but whatever it is there's a kind of this sense of god is anxious to hear the responses and reactions of the person the people that god is creating so there's something there that i think is worthy of discussion um and he does and god does the same thing here god says to cain where is your brother right so again wanting some kind of reaction some kind of understanding some kind of self-reflection of uh, of the brothers great so um um so let, let's move on uh um Right, so again, this is a story of mach, mach, uh, of uh, of rejection, and God is the cause. So, um, so if God is the cause of this machloka, and the results are not what God intended, what should what should be our proof? Right. So, um, all right. So here we're trying to we're trying to ask: Is is there a part of the Torah that actually says that? God causes machloket, but God didn't intend things to work out this way. That actually God thought maybe that actually this would solve the problem of machloket. So in a way, you could use this story of Cain and Abel to show God being a God that doesn't want machloket in the world. It felt like actually that was he was that God was hoping for obedience, and God didn't find it in the Garden of Eden. God tried to manipulate things so it wouldn't happen here, and it does, um, and that God is in some way sad about that, that God feels like God has failed at this point, and maybe it's what will cause God to go and find a very different kind of, um, of, of person to relate to, meaning Noah. Right, so I asked you so here, like, so if, if, if you want to agree with that, you're going to have to look here and try to say, is there a place here where God actually feels some guilt about what God has done, meaning like, you know what? I didn't mean for this all to happen. I thought it would turn out much differently. And because of that, I need to in some way not punish people as harshly as I would normally if I thought they were going completely against me because part of this was my doing, all right? So, so I find that pretty interesting. And then really, um, um, And then we were able to answer this question. And then we're up to kind of Noah and the flood. And so in a way, so now we're saying, oh, those first two stories were about maybe the first one is God kind of unintentionally even or intentionally creating this machloket and not being entirely happy about that. So God goes to the Cain and Abel story and tries to help manipulate things so there is no machloket. And yet there is machloket. And so now God maybe kind of leaves and is, is pretty frustrated. And now God's saying, I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, and I'm frustrated about a ton of things, right? Because I'm going to destroy the world. So I'm frustrated about everything. This is just one component. But the person I need to find now who I want to connect with is someone who's not going to argue with me at all. Okay. And, and that's what we see kind of in the story of Noah. A really, he, it's not Noah, the, Noah, the machloket maker. It's Noah, the non-machloket maker. And Noah is not, Noah hears about what's going to happen. And Noah's just kind of like, okay, I'll do whatever you say, God, as long as I'm not hurt, you know, 
you know, it'd be interesting to see if, if um, I mean, God helps Noah be a non machloket maker because God says, I'm gonna, not just going to save you, Noah, I'm going to save you and your family. And I'm telling you why, because, you know, you're righteous and blameless in this generation. And uh, so so God makes it pretty easy, I'd say, for Noah not to be a machloket maker. But Noah could have could have very easily said, um, even though I don't know the people in the world, are you really sure you want to destroy everyone? Isn't there a at least someone out there that is actually good and worthy of being being um, saved? Okay, obviously I'm saying that because we're gonna. That's a little hint that we're gonna hear that later on from Abraham, who's gonna say that. But Noah does not say that. Noah is not a fighter for justice. Noah is not a fighter for anyone, but really himself. And so, but Noah follows, follows, follows God, and uh, and and again. And God is probably picking Noah because of that. And God is making it easy through the through the saving of his family, which we have no idea what the positive, if, if those that family is positive or negative, have positive or negative character traits, right? But we're just like, there's an assumption that they're all good, but come on, is that real? I mean, I mean, I, I, I think here, God is really trying to say, what happens if I link myself with a namach loka maker what happens if i move forward with a namach loka maker and so we see in the text noah doing just as he commanded noah doing just as he commanded uh, and, and and by the way and our modern commentator like rabbi Sachs, really kind of pushes back at noah and is like this is not a hero moses is not uh, noah is not a hero he's a follower but our followers followers are not the jewish heroes we want someone who's going to stop and push back and the story, basically, of who God is looking for is not completely over at this point. So, um, and, and yet Noah does get the blessing, gets blessing, and Noah is asked to fill the earth. And so, right, so now we have this kind of, this sense of, we have these three stories. So we go from Adam and Eve, where there was machloket because of this hierarchy. We have God trying to change the um, the hierarchical level, and still there's machloket because even though God thinks God's done a good job here, Cain doesn't. Cain sees the hierarchy and is jealous of, of someone who has more than he does, and he goes about and kills. Now we've got someone who doesn't question it at all. There's not even a need of a high, there's no hierarchy there. It's basically Noah doing everything and following following God. And that's gonna bring us to our, our next our next two stories because uh, and this is where um, this is where we're thinking that if following God is a good thing, like right, being a non machloke maker, well, what happens if we have people become followers to the extreme? Okay, and here we see in the Tower of Babel story that it's not a following of God; it's a following of other people. Right? People are gathering together, and people are being doing the same of everything and that's where we had these words everyone on earth had one language and devarim achadim this is sameless this is no difference so if we look at adam and eve's story differences between adam and eve create some kind of machloket and create some kind of rebellion create some kind of disagreements and arguments differences between cain and abel even though god tries to even those differences all of a sudden those differences are what creates that murder, right? Now we've got uh, Noah that has no difference and things go pretty well for Noah. But what happens if we have a whole city where there are no differences at all? No heart, no one, everyone is exactly the same. Had one language and Dvarim Achadim. And we looked at what those words Dvarim Achadim means. And all of them were basically saying that, that you know, these people are, are totally the same. There's nothing that they disagree with. There's nothing they do wrong. But of course, they are actually... Uh, they're 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 still pretty waging war against all like the lack of difference. So for some reason, God, I, if God had in God's head, if I can just get everyone to do the same thing, if I can just get everyone to agree with me, agree with each other, there's going to be no disagreement with 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 with, with me at all. So I'm going to get rid of machlok at all together. And yet, the very sameness and the very togetherness of them was like what actually causes them to. Um, causes them to do bad. You know, this is, God actually looks at this and is like, I made a mistake here. I created people who that are such followers that either they're following all, they're following each other to wage war against me, God, or they're just doing the wrong thing by trying to stay stay put and trying not to move around and trying to, um, to, to not do anything, right? So it's like they're trying not to be scattered. 
and we saw that uh, that that so so again, God feels that um, the Tower of Babel represents basically the logical consequences of agreeing with everyone, everything. And it basically is trying to tell us that that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing where there, when there's group think, it's a bad thing where it's a bad thing where there's no individuality whatsoever. But wait a second, the individuality of the Garden of Eden and the, the, the man being this, woman being this, Cain being this, uh, Abel being this, that's what causes all the friction. But isn't it crazy? The Tower of Babel shows actually the opposite is also true. Having no differences also causes friction. And, 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 and so God is almost kind of like a, like a, probably puts God's hands on like, I can't win. I can't win this way. I can't win this way. What am I going to do? And, and, and we saw, right, the very, right, we called that idea of, of name being kind of being someone being like an individual. But we see at the end that God wants to mix up this sameness. God is like, this is just not working. This is not the way I'm going. Like, I'd rather if if differences brings about machloket, if sameness brings about machloket, well, I'm going to go back to my, what I really want is I want individuality and I want people and, I, and maybe I can live with that machloket in a way. And then we get to, right, and, and, and so we see that actually the very thing that, uh, that God actually blessed the earth, kind of wanting people to fill up space and be multi multiply and scatter, uh, we see that twice. And we see that being a curse to the people of Babel because they don't want to scatter. But God, in a sense, wants people to scatter, wants individuality, wants people to be their own of their own mind and own own thinking. Right. So. Um, right. So, again, some 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 pieces for kind of what what happens with Babel. Um, right. Unity and uniformity is kind of what what uh, Rabbi Held was talking about here. And. Um, all right, and so here we kind of get to the uh, the story of Abraham. And interestingly enough, what we're going to see is that we're going to see two stories of Abraham. We're going to see the first story of Abraham as a machloket maker, and the second story of of Abraham as obedient, right? Completely obedient. And by the way, maybe that's the answer to the question. If like. You know, if differences creates the machloka maker, if sameness creates the the also a machloka maker, what do I what do what do I need to have in this world? Well, actually, I maybe I need to have someone that is at times a machloka maker and at times a, a obedient, right? Maybe I don't want to choose. Maybe I want in one person the ability to know when is the right time for machloka making, when is the right time for obedience. That's a, an approach that actually is not the approach that we took in the class because we actually took the approach in class that even the second story that we saw as obedience, it is re-looked at through the eyes of the book of Job as also being that actually uh, Abraham could have and should have and would have been perfectly fine and justified and, um, and, and even it would have been acceptable to God if God, if Abraham had been a machloket maker there. So here we go. So here we have obviously our first story about Abraham, right? Who said to leave and kind of uh, Abraham goes to, and, and, and after he's told about his, about his wife having a baby, he's told about these cities of Sodom and Amorah. And the way we kind of understood those stories was that actually God knew exactly what was going to happen to the cities. God knew there was no good people there at all. And God, but God pretended for a moment to show Abraham the cities and said, what do you think about this, about this? Now, that idea right there of kind of putting something before Abraham and saying, tell me what you think. I mean, that's God inviting Machloket, God inviting kind of I want you part of the conversation. I want you to push me in one way or another. I don't want you to just say, God, this is great. Or God saying that I can't have people think that I'm a God who just does and tells them afterwards. I want them involved in the decision-making process, even if that decision-making process means that machloket might happen as a result, right? That's pretty interesting, right? 
Um, so, so in a way, you can say God is actually trying, almost raising, elevating the idea of Machloket. Like God is like, Tower of Babel, that's not where I want to go. I want to have that conversation. I want to at least allow for the openness and possibility that people can agree or people can disagree. All right. Um, and so he creates this little, this little test. He manipulates, basically. He knows what's going to happen, but, but he goes and plays dumb to, to Avram. Avram, this city right here, um, you know, um, I think I'm going to destroy it. And Abraham, of course, says, no way, you can't. And they get into this kind of big, big arguing, arguing piece that's going on here, right? Um, and, um, and, and it's really, and so then, and we ended with the idea of like, was Abraham a success or a failure, right? For Abraham's perspective, he sees the city destroyed. And Abraham's like, well, you know, everything I did didn't work at all. But from God's perspective, ah, right? That God set up this task precisely for why? Because God wants to invite Abraham into the conversation. And obviously God is ready and willing to accept the idea that Abraham could say, God, you're not acting the right way. Right? God is willing to have people push God. Right? And again, we saw it at the very end of our course when God says, leave me alone, Moses. Hint, hint. Right? I want you to be part of this conversation. I want to hear your arguments. I want to hear your action. Right? And that's at a point where the other people are rebelling, that God's like, I want to hear you tell me why I shouldn't do it. Right. So it's it's very interesting. Um, you know, so one, one can make the case that actually maybe, um, and I'll just say like this, uh, it's like, right, God manipulates a situation here in the, Abba, in the Sodom and Amora story in order to show Abraham and see what Abraham does. Right. Maybe actually God does the same thing in our golden calf story and says, like, I'm manipulating the situation. Like, like Moses was ready to come down at the right time. He's like, oh, no, stay here for a little bit longer. Moses, like, don't, uh, you know, make them uh, make them sweat a little bit and let's see what happens. And then God is it's really maybe the story of the golden calf is all about just God saying, how will Moses react? Maybe. OK, um, so. Um, so we we have this we have the story and then again we so we've broken up the Sodom and Amora story and we've and and we've said that the Sodom and Amora story is is God as a machloket maker. Then we get to the Akedah story, right? The binding of Isaac, where God makes a request and Abraham just kind of goes for it, right? And and we're saying, wait a second, I thought you know once a machloket maker always a machloket. Why is he showing obedience here? That just doesn't make sense at all in the Akedah story. And of course, Richard Elliot Freeman came up with a bunch of ideas of why it might have been that Abraham was silent. And they, you know, uh, you know, one idea was God doesn't, uh, God doesn't. Here's the question: Where about that? And one idea is a Abraham doesn't, uh, God doesn't ask. This isn't anything that's even open for discussion. So Abraham can discuss when God presents it for him as open for discussion. But when God doesn't, Abraham just has to kind of go with it and be obedient. And the other idea is that, um, and I think Eric, you, 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 you brought this up many times, is the idea that he's too involved and he doesn't quite understand like um like can i be an impartial kind of just judge of good and evil when my own child's involved it's a little too messy in a way so i can't really respond respond to this one but um but at the end we have this kind of idea okay and then 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 what we're going to do is so we've got Avra, abe at sodom and amora kind of saying is he's a mafloka maker abe at the akida being obedient but then we have this idea from Judy Clister, which is an amazing idea, saying, you know what? There are such things called subversive sequels in the Bible. What's a sequel? A sequel is a story like a part two, right? Like a sequel of a movie, right? A part two of the, um, of the story. And what Judy says is that sometimes that story rewrites what we think to be correct. Sometimes that story presents a new idea or understanding about how that story should be thought about and what the answers should be that we came to. And so what Judy says is, right, how do you find the stories? You find them by kind of linking certain things together. And Judy came up with a couple ways that we can kind of link the story of the Akedah to the story of Job. And, 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 and she does it in a, in a couple ways. Um, right, she finds these different connections here, and then she takes us to the book of Job. And then what we were, what we did, and so here are the kind of those hints, right, that kind of say like there's some textual kind of 
a, a close reader or readers that know the Bible really well, the, these words would jump out and be like, ooze, didn't I hear that word before? Ooze? Oh, I heard that word in the uh, in the Akedah story. Huh. Oh, chesed chaldeans. Oh, um, wait, didn't I hear that word before? Huh, that's weird. All right. Oh, um, fear of God. Oh, didn't I hear that before? Who did I? I only heard that one other time in the Torah. Oh, yeah, I heard that about Avra. Interesting, right? Um, right. Early in the morning. Oh, right. So, so again, and, and, and of course, we have this, this idea from Rashi himself saying there's a connection between what's going on in both of the stories that in the beginning of each of the stories, there's like this biblical kind of event, ha- this, this heavenly event happening between God and Satan arguing with each other, like, and God in each case, the Job case and the Abraham case, God is talking about how great his hero is. And Satan saying, oh, yeah, of course, it's, of course, that hero is great. You made their life so easy. Of course, they're going to do everything you ask. But the minute you don't do something that they want, they don't do something, they do something that you don't like, you're going to see exactly what happens. And there's kind of a connection there via via kind of Rashi's comment, who's bringing kind of the Midrash there. So um, then we looked at kind of the similarities between the story of Job and the story of, um, you know, and it might be helpful to actually go through that video. You can find it on YouTube. The video of the uh, 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 of the book of to- Job, there it is, right right there. Um, how do you do that? Okay, um, right. And if we see at the end, I'll just kind of put this is an eleven minute video. But if we put all the way at the end, you'll see the full story. I think. why bad things happen to good people. Rather, it does invite us to trust. Okay, so um, I'm just putting up this, um, just putting up this, this, this picture right here. So if you want to go over it really quickly, to kind of understand what the book of Job was saying, because the book of Job is very similar to the Akedah story, but the, but, but we, we leave the Akedah story asking ourselves, well, what happened? Uh, A, how come Abraham didn't didn't uh, protest, and um, and what about his son? Right, he was ready to sacrifice his son. Well, here's a story where where people are killed at the end. Right in the Akedah story, they aren't they aren't killed, but here Job's family. And how does Job kind of react in that way? And we see basically at the end of the story of Job that Job is arguing with God, saying, "Why does the world work like this, God? How could you do such a thing?" I thought that I was actually right, and we can look at this like Job's protest, right? Right, um, you know, and then we have God's explanation, and God's explanation is basically to Job, um, you don't understand how I work, Job. You don't understand the world. You see it between a small little perspective, but I see the entire world. So you're seeing stuff as good and evil in this very narrow thing, but I see everything. And I understand how the world works. But even more important than, than, than what God says, it's that God says. And I'll say that again. Even more important than what God says, it's that God says. Meaning that God doesn't say, how dare you, Job, talk to me and question me. God never says that. God is saying, I've been waiting for this, Job. I've been waiting for you to ask these questions. So let's talk it out. Let me show you what I what I can teach you and see if I can help you understand who I am and how I work to the best of my ability. And in a way, what this does is it asks us to question, did Abraham do the right thing, right? Did Abraham, just by following, is that the only way that Abraham could have been? And so now all of a sudden we see actually Abraham, Abraham is almost picked precisely because he's a, a machloka maker in the Sodom and Gomorrah story. And even the story where we have obedience, we can question whether that was actually the answer, whether actually God really wished for there to be machloka. And in a way that that so we almost have this story later on in the in the in the Bible to order to ask us to revisit our understandings that really God wants to be obedient. And maybe at the end, we see actually God not only as God has actually found God's way, like God has found God's stride. The first he goes from, I don't know if I like Machloket. I don't know if I like Machloket. Um, well, okay, so I do like obedience, but I don't know if I really do like obedience when it's taken to an extreme. Let's go back to Machloket and see, oh, I like that, how that works. 
oh, um, obedience. And then we're saying, oh, I guess, guess they, I guess really what, what God wants is sometimes machloket, sometimes obedience. But no, actually, maybe God really wants machloket all the time, right? And that's kind of how we end. So then we have these questions right here, right? What gen the general ideas, right? What's our proof that according to the Torah, machloket is not necessarily a bad thing? I think to answer that question, you're going to have to kind of show where actually maybe God brings up machloket and machloket is used to sway God and change God's opinion. Um, <clears throat> what's our proof that the opposite of machloket, which would be obedience, is considered and then discarded? Well, I think you're going to have to look at, at kind of this section right over here to be able to do that, like kind of considered, oh, do I like this? But what happens if COVID stores extreme? Let's go back to this idea of machloket. And then what's our proof? The Bible asks us to relook at a story that seems to show obedience, hint, hint, <clears throat> and asks us to consider the possibility of it happening the other way. Great. I hope this all helps you in your studying for the test.